Okay, good afternoon guys. Um, before we start, as always, let's do a customary instant poll to check if we can hear the volume correctly. Go put that on your screens now. If you can let me know if the sound is perfect, too loud or too low, uh, just indicate on your screens now, if you could. Okay, too loud. One second. Why don't we just turn this down a little bit. Okay guys, how's that sound for you now? Is the sound too loud, too low? Is that perfect? Just um, re-indicate. Perfect, good. Alright, excellent guys. Thanks very much for that. Brilliant. Alright guys, what we're going to talk about today is uh, cash and risk management. Very, very important in these very volatile markets that we understand the risk we're taking on. So before I start, as always, need to read our risk warning that spread betting and CFD trading both carry a high level of risk to your capital with the possibility of losing more than your initial investments. These products might not be suitable for all investors and are only intended for people over the age of 18. Please ensure you're fully aware of the risks involved and if necessary, seek independent financial advice. Again, this is educational only. The content of this webinar is the, per is the personal opinion, opinion of the moderator, not intertrader.com. The content does not constitute financial investment or tax advice. You're advised to discuss your CIFI requirements with an independent financial advisor prior to entering any bet. Intertrader.com is not responsible and disclaims all and any liability for the content of comments during the session. Okay, so an introduction to risk and money management, cash management, however you want to talk it about it. It's really just talking about the money we've deposited, how we attack the markets and the risk that we're willing to take on board uh, versus the amount of potential profit we're willing to make. So the key to successful trading. Now the biggest reason people don't make money uh, in, the, in the markets when they're trading is it's quite simple. They run their losses uh, and they are larger than their profits. Okay. So this is something I've seen over the years and done myself time and time again. Um, it, you know, it does sound obvious, but it really is um, quite a common occurrence that traders run their losses a lot further than they do their profits. And again, we'll go into the reasons uh, why this happens a little bit later on. But um, you know, we can do some quite simple um, explanations, some quite simple ratios uh, to kind of combat this. But again. Um, Nobody likes to trade and nobody likes to lose. We all trade to hopefully make money, but we have to be realistic. We have to factor that, that at some point in our trading career, we're going to have a losing trade. And it's not just how, the size of the trade that's important. It's also how we deal with it, how, how we justify what we've done. So the disciplined trader or the rogue trader, yeah? if you aim to be successful and make money out of trading, which do we, do we think we need to be? Again, all these things sound very simple, but when we get caught up in the emotions of the markets, we get caught in the noise, we get caught in the experience, it's very easy to let our rules slide and to let our emotions get the better of us. And this ultimately will always cost us money in the long run. So a simple statement. If you don't look to make more money on profitable trades than losing trades, in the long run you're doomed to failure. Right? The reasons for people holding on to unsuccessful trades, the number one the absolute first one on the list is fear. Okay, the fear of realizing losses keeps people in a trade. Now, you have to think, going back to our psychology seminars and the psychology of the markets, the markets know sometimes where to push in order to get people into positions they A, don't want to be, or B, they don't want to get out of. How many times have you said to yourself when you're in an unsuccessful trade, the market shouldn't be doing this, the market has to turn at some point. It's being manipulated or simply I don't understand why the market is doing this. These are all factors of the market and the market sentiment that try and make us doubt ourselves. The markets will always extend and they will always at times push to try and make people experience that fear. The ability to move the markets in such a way and make them go against what, what our thinking is. To, in, in order to make people stay into trades, even add to trades, when really they should be getting out. So again, the fear thing is quite simple to understand. If you're doing a trade, for instance, and you want to make £100 and you risk £300, sorry, you want to make £300 and you're risking £100, if that trade starts to go to £100, £150 offside or against you to £200, yeah, then, then you know you know you pass your risk reward. If you're working off a one to three strategy, and you're trying to make 300 pounds of 100 pounds. 
if you get to the 200 pound mark you know that really that that's not good you're not keeping to risk ratio and then if the market blips even fur further and suddenly you're 300 pounds so you're losing 300 pounds and that was your target of what to make then you, you start to think your mind starts to think well I've gone so far past my stop that well obviously the market has to come back at some point and this is where we kind of trick ourselves um, we're really kind of tripping up on the whole risk reward the whole risk strategy ethos because if you're trying to make 300 pounds for 100 and then suddenly you're losing 300 pounds then what have you got to do in order to make you 300 pounds back you have to get to a scratch which is now 300 pound your target and then make 300 pounds which is now 600 pounds total the total amount of money you have to make for that one trade that you initially only risking 100 pounds and that's how these things can quickly escalate out of control so the market goes against you there's nothing wrong with saying okay the market's not doing ex exactly what I expect at this point in time so I'll get out for my risk reward which a gives you a, a positive feeling because you've got out for, for, for what rule you have set B keeps you to that amount of money that you'd committed to risk on that one trade yep so when when the opportunity does go go down and maybe it does go to three four hundred pounds offside that you know if, if you would have held that trade well then you can start getting back into that trade at a better position then you re recalculate your risk reward and say okay well at this point the market should retrace at some point from here so I'll risk another hundred pounds and this time I'll try to make four hundred pounds so the market's overextended people are getting out but because you've stuck to your risk reward you've only lost 100 pounds the markets come off a lot further than you thought so you're buying and your total investment is in 200 pounds so then you only have to make yeah another two three four hundred pounds for the market to come back to where it'd be a scratch anyway and you're in profit so again it's very easy to say and it's very easy not to do when you're involved in the markets but by putting these simple rules in place and being aware of them you know if you do stop yourself out for the rules that you put in place you're going to feel a lot better and ultimately you're going to become a lot better trader because a disciplined trader always in the long term makes more money so again poor rules as we've kind of explained in that example not putting your stops or your exit levels in place and not keeping to them yeah another reason is fundamental news again we've talked about this in a lot of previous seminars if you're not looking at the fundamental news the key speakers the economic calendar um, what what big events are coming out that will shape the markets we can be in trades that go against us and if we're not aware of what's happening in the news wire and within the economy then you know we're, we're gonna have trades go against us without actually understanding and number four really is just having the wrong opinion sometimes it's quite in, you know it's quite reassuring that uh, you know you're not right all the time but it's quite powerful in, in the same uh, respect if you're not feeling confident at a trade you're not feeling good you haven't got all the feelings we talked about in the, in the trading psychology uh, modules we've done then maybe it's just time to get out you know that we don't understand what's going on we're not feeling comfortable we don't think this is the right trade then cut your losses save your bullets save your ammunition for when you do see things you are feeling confident and then you can you know then trade with confidence and and set your rules accordingly so again it's all about cash management that's that's the real key it's about time of the cash management with the market situation how it's trading and what we've got at our disposal so risk management so risk management is basically the same as cash management so it, it's about protecting the capital you have in deposit so one of the biggest mistakes people make when they're trading is not managing the money capital is king so by its very definition is the most important asset you have when trading so it doesn't only give you the confidence it also facilitates when and how much you can physically trade so it's very very important it's not like going down to the local bookies with, with 20 pounds in your pockets and then you can have four or five pound bets and then you're done you know with, with, with trading it doesn't work like that you know you can lose just as you know much even more as your initial investment each time the market moves so every trade has the ability to lose your entire capital if you're not prepared if you've not got your rules in place so again remember the key difference like we've said it's not like fixed bed uh, fix odds uh, and betting you know you can lose more than what you initially put in yeah and especially when you spread betting and you have to take the spread on board you know you can be offside in a position the, the second you press that button so it's very very important we build these things into um, into how we trade 
Okay, Chris is saying, if I'm down 300 pounds, why not just buy more, which will cover the first loss when the market goes up again? Well, again, Chris, it's about putting rules in place. It's just as easy as if you're down 300 pounds and buying another 300 pounds worth. What's to say the market won't come off in the straight line 20, 30 ticks? You know, if trading was just as simple, every time you were offside, you know, you'd double up. You know, even, double, even trouble double, you know, a casino mentality. Where'd you stop? Yeah, if you put £300 down and you put another £300 on, what if you've only got £500 in your account? Yeah, just by saying, by having simple rules in place and trading within your means. You know, trading's a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah, there's, no, there's nothing clever about going into the markets and taking a big position offside, then let it come in back and scratch it. You're always looking to make money, so we're looking to make and get that edge. That's what we're trying to do. But what we're also trying to do is be intelligent about it. Yeah. 300 pounds to some people might be a lot of money to be offside when you see me trade it isn't a lot of money to me however it's all within how much capital you have on deposit and in your account so it's just about making sure the ratios are right um, again you know if you feel that you're being pushed or squeezed out of position there is absolutely nothing wrong with buying more at a cheaper price but you have to be then confident the market's going to go up because if it doesn't then you know your 300 pounds becomes 600 pounds, which can become 1200 pounds, which can become you know exponential losses. Yeah, if the market does continue to go against you, so it's just about putting practical rules in place. That's all. Uh, again, how everyone trades is entirely down to down to, the, down to, the, to themselves. Where they trade with the end of the day, guys. You know we can trade wherever we want. These seminars are just designed to give you the tools, take them into the market, and see what you can do. No, no worries, Chris. That's no, a, a very good question. Uh, again, there's no right or wrong questions here. You know, I always appreciate anybody taking the time to put a question on. And uh, yeah, brilliant. Thanks for that, Chris. So another thing that I like to instill in people is that you can act like a pro even if you're a novice. Okay? There's nothing to say. We're not in the pits these days. We're not, we're not wearing our jackets and we're not screaming and we're not writing tickets down. <coughs> we're all trading off the back of a, of a PC. You know, some people might have five screens, one screen. It doesn't matter. Nobody can see you. Nobody can see who you are. We've got complete anonymity. So we have to act like a pro, keep our rules in place, because that's what we can control. We can't control the market. We can't control how it moves. What we can control is how we act, how we think, how we approach the markets, and how we utilize our capital. So we can follow four simple rules that we're going to come to in the next slide. Number three, avoid excuses. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. If you ever talk to, you know, to your your partners about trading or your friends if they don't trade themselves generally they will not care about your excuses for not making money as people don't in life the markets certainly don't care so we need to get rid of excuses as quick as we can because they're fairly irrelevant you know we have to justify things in in numerical terms in risk reward in physical money excuses they have no place in the markets okay now the next point is remember the markets aren't against you the markets Again, don't take it personally. They couldn't care less about you. The market is just facilitating a function, and we're just involved in the movement. Okay, so you can never take moves personally. Yeah, it's really something I, you know, got my head around quite early in my trading career, and it served me well. You know, don't take things personally. If you get a trade wrong, it doesn't matter. You get a trade right, you beat somebody else, pat yourself on the back. That's how you've got to accept it. And that leads us on to our next point, which is perfect. Except that you won't get the market right all the time. If you, if you know, you understand and you factor this in again to your risk reward ratio. Maybe you're winning, winning to losing ratio. Maybe you say in a trading session, I want to make um, three out of five winning trades. You know, set yourselves achievable goals. Set yourselves realistic goals. Don't just say, right, I'm feeling good today. I'm going to make five winning trades and call it a day. Because the likelihood is one of them traders, you know, just off the odds, could be a loser. So again, it's all about being pragmatic, how you approach the market, and how you set your rules around your capital, around your trading style. Tie them together, and that's going to give you more of an edge when you try and attack the markets. So four, the four steps that we can really apply to trading. Now, as always, you will see that this is a key, key theme throughout any of the seminars um, I ever hold. All about preparation. Yeah, I cannot stress this enough. If you turn on your training screens and you've not read the overnight news, you don't have any opinion on the market, you don't read your charts, you don't have your levels, that's not being prepared. The likelihood is 
you're going to find it very hard to trade and make money. Okay, your entry level. There's no point rushing into a trade. The market will always give you more than one opportunity to get on the back of any real move. So your target levels. Now, where do we think the market's going? Again, have we been pragmatic? Do we know yesterday's daily range? Do we know our pivot point? Do we know our levels of key resistance, our support one, two, and three, our resistance one, two, and three, previous day's highs, previous day's volume? Simple things. All this information's there for you. But you know, if you're not aware of it, then you know what happens if we reach yesterday's high? You know, is that significant? Is it a significant break or is it a significant resistance point? So again, your stop level. Where am I wrong on this trade? Yeah, that's again maybe the the real crux of what we talk about cash and risk management. When do we get out? When do we decide to press that button, realize that loss, uh, and take that you know take that on board? It's preparation. As I've said, you can't just log on and trade. Um, well, I'm, again, I'm never saying I'm not never telling you what to do. I'm just advising that um, in my experience that it, even if it's five minutes preparation, that'll be five minutes well spent, and it'll put you, it'll give you something, it'll give you some some foundations. Um, so, what are the currency pairs done overnight? Again, forex markets, four trillion traded every day, huge. Might be an indication of you know what's happening in particular regions, particular countries. Could have an effect on the markets. Could not. Doesn't. It's not hard to look at. So check any overnight news. Did anything happen overnight with any unexpected announcements, speakers? These are things we need to look at. Did the markets move as you expected? Do a little bit of you know an analysis of the previous day. Okay, so what data is coming out today? Very, very important. Look at the economic calendar. Are there any key speakers who's speaking at the ECB, the Eurozone? Yeah? Then again, if you're trading technically, are you aware of your target levels? You know, have you got a particular trend pattern in place? If you look to your candlestick formations, is there any reversals on the daily? Is any continuation? Any continuations? There's all these things you have to look at. And again, it's all about the preparation. That what works for you. There's no right or wrong amount of preparation. Some people can over prepare. There's also no exact, you know, list of what you should do. But there is. A nice balance that if you look at things like your technicals and your fundamentals, you look at your key levels, and then you, you know you check to see what the market's doing. Then that's that's you know that's that's a good basis to go into the market for that day and trade. If you haven't done these things, then you know you're almost trading blind. You know the market's rallying up, and we don't know why because there's been overnight news, or we don't know there's a big technical level. Then you know are we going to make the most out of that that profitable trade? You know we're just guessing, we're just gambling. And again, the weekend of uh, the value of weekend analysis. So the next slide. Weekend analysis is is really quite important because the markets generally stop trading. So if we don't hold positions, you know, we can kind of take a step back and just give ourselves a couple of days, you know, just to analyse and, and to to truly understand what's happened. So again, we can use the the, the weekend to review the past week's trading and activity. So. If, <coughs> Sorry, if you're not running overnight positions, it's a great opportunity to look at the markets completely objectively. Look at charts, look how the fundamental news or technical news um, affected how the markets traded, and then you know go off the back of this. You know, plan plan for your week ahead by looking at what's happened in the past. So again, look at the data releases for that week. Look at the central bank speakers. Any other event that could shape. The trading week or affect the product you're particularly trading, you know, it's good to have it in the diary or in your plan, so you, so you know when it's coming out. So if you're planning a bullish or bearish stance, what's going to come out to change that outlook? What happened over the last week's trading? Did it tie in with your opinion? So again, you got to be firm in your opinions and your views, but you've got to be, you know, allow for flexibility. You know, it's a rapidly changing environment in the trading world, and there's lots of things to assimilate at any period in time. So we have to make sure that you know our plans give us the framework in order to work around, and our risk strategy and risk management gives us enough flexibility that if we do get things right, that we maybe you know increase our positions or we trade more size. So you can put a sliding scale of importance for for most of these things. So especially for figures, you know, if you keep a log about what figures you've traded in the past, what you've made money, you know, maybe non-farm payroll is the one you trade every month. Maybe there's EDW again. It's all about putting a sliding scale on importance of what has worked for you in the past. Yeah, because it's worked for you in the past, probability wise, it's more likely to work for you in the future. 
So number two, your entry level. So depending on your trading style, looking at your entry levels uh, can enable you to preempt market moves. So again, this may be dynamic or predictable, but knowing uh, when the market reaches a certain price can give you the edge. Yeah, what do I do now? Yeah, it's all about knowing where the market is in relative to fair value and where the market is within the daily range. Yeah, and if you tie your levels and your thinking around these things, it will give you all the more confidence when you say, okay, the market's down here. We think this is value. It's holding on this level of support. My other indicators tell me this. This historically has been where the buyers come out back into the market. So you use these levels to get into your trade. So again, think about what the market might do in response to a certain figure. Yeah, what we need to go with the price action or the market is it going to retrace before you know you're given an opportunity to get back in the trade. So remember, 80% of the time the markets will retrace 50% of the initial move. So you don't have to chase it. So this is absolutely typical and the strategy I try to employ with the non-farm payrolls that we traded on Friday. So generally, what's happened is we've missed or not got filled in the initial move. Uh, so what we do is we wait for a retracement of the, the uh, initial five minute candle, maybe 33 or 50%, and then we use that to either go with the market and a continuation pattern or, or turn and reverse. Unfortunately, the figure was much, much better than they expected. So the market just continued to ramp. But if we use this principle that you know any kind of initial move, when any kind of big piece of information or data comes out, there will be an element of people taking profit and we can use that as an entry point. So again, it's just about being smart. It's not always about being about fastest finger first. Yeah, we can use the market movement in, in two ways. We can use it to, to go with the momentum trade or wait for people to take profit and pull back and then wait for the momentum to continue. So target level. So what are you aiming to achieve at the trade? Okay, might sound simple, but you know, if you're looking at monetary terms, you know, put that in tick moves as well. You know, give yourself some realistic idea of what percent of that day's move you're particularly looking for. So you're looking for a 10, 20, 30 percent move of the daily range. How will that tie in with your risk reward? How will that tie in with how much capital you've got? So the market's prime for a big move. You know, is it or is it a sucker move? You know, is the market been building up to this or we've just seen because of the low volumes a spike? Yeah, so don't be greedy. If you've caught the back of a, a, a good move, it's because your opinions analysis were correct. Yeah, or are you just being lucky? This is what you have to evaluate. So again, take profit where it's appropriate. So once you've set your target um, for where you believe the market is going, stick to it. It's not to say you have to get all your capital out or all your trade out at that one particular level. So if you've hit the level, you know, the way you thought the market was going to go to, take half your profit, put your stop in for a scratch and let the rest run. These are the differences that can make you a better trader, a much more profitable trader, by identifying your right, locking in some profit and then seeing what the market could do. Because again, the markets do tend to spike and do tend to overextend due to the low volumes. So again, uh, bringing on to that point, the market will often push further through these uh, potential levels uh, that we've put in place. So again, you know, there's nothing wrong with banking profit around these levels and letting the rest of it ride. So we'll come onto the classic excuse for not taking profits, um, not stopping out. You know, I wish I'd done that, um, etc. But again, it's all great, isn't it, with perfect hindsight that we get a trade on side, we don't take the profit, it comes back, we scratch it or take a loss. And we all say to ourselves, well, I wish I took it out of that level. Or again, we take our trade offside, past our stop, and it goes even further and we get out for a much bigger loss than we anticipated. And we think to ourselves, yeah, I wish I'd got out of that initial stop point. This is the emotion. These are the things we need to kind of strip out. If we've set these rules in place and that we know our targets, then we've, they're there for a reason. We've set them. We have to stick to them in some shape or form. There's no point being the best um, trader in hindsight saying, well, again, I was right here, I was wrong here, and I knew I was, but I didn't do anything about it. I just let the trade go so far back to me that I had to take a scratch or a loss. I didn't bank the profit. You know? No, again, going back to excuses. The market doesn't care about that. Nobody cares about that. So stop levels. So here's a big one. And it really should be, I suppose, one of the first rules in the four steps. But it's easy to look at the market and believe, think, have an opinion where the market is going. But what if you're wrong? 
you know, where do you get out? What price are you, is that you're physically actually wrong at that period in time? So knowing this advance can save you not just a lot of money, but pain and stress. Markets are often going to move in exaggerated fashion, but they often give you the opportunity <coughs> to, to reinstate the position, which means that you'll always have a point where you think you're wrong, and you probably are wrong, to get out before the market does go the way you expect it to. <coughs> so it's all about you know making sure that we use the right kind of risk reward ratio, making sure we've got some rules in place because there's absolutely no point taking trades further offside than than, than you plan for, and then not being able to take profit out of it because the market's gone too far. So that's the whole point I keep saying about being a little bit more flexible with your stops. <coughs> Excuse me. The markets will always give you more than one chance to be right. It will always give you maybe one or two chances to admit you're wrong okay and that's the important thing to know because the market will tell you wrong give you an opportunity then it might not give you another chance to get out for the same price where you can always get tend yeah not always but you can tend to get back into a winning position when you're going with the momentum because that should go further because that's the winning trade you're looking for <coughs> excuse me so again uh, the market is emotive okay so the successful trader acts in a rational manner during this chaos. You know, we're the, we're the, the light, we're the, we're the people that look through the noise and, and trade on the back of what we know. So stopping yourself out of a trade when you're not happy, uh, if you're not happy in it, is not easy to do. No one likes doing it. But it will save you money in the long run and it will make you feel better. So it all brings us back to risk reward. Why are we doing this trading in the first place? Okay, next is asking, is there any kind of technical formula you might use in terms of placing your stop? The, the, again, people ask me this all the time, Nick. There's, there's no set mathematical formula. There's no um, risk-reward ratio that works for everybody. You know, if you tend to work off a, a three-to-one ratio, then you're giving yourself a good opportunity, you know, to let the market do what it needs to do and not take on too much risk. There's no perfect formula. There's no perfect... Um, amount of money you can risk to make X amount of money. It's all about just tying up your your style, your attitude, your capital you have in the deposit and making it work for you. Um, so I generally work around the three to one. So again, this kind of example, if you're looking to make, you know, three thousand pounds then then risk a thousand. That's about as generic as I, I can make it without going into your trading strategy and other kind of key things, then it'd be wrong of me to give you a, give you no what. I think you should trade off. So again, risk reward. Um, if you're going to bet £10, again, I don't like using the betting um, scenario, but it just works well in this instance. If I tell you I've got a, a dead cert, a 10 to 1 horse, and you bet £10 and it's going to win, I think you'd agree, I'll take that bet. What about 3 to 1? Okay, it's getting less exciting, but then what about 1 to 3? So you bet £3 to get a pound profit back. Not so enticing. So why do the same with trading? Why would you trying to make £3,000 when your stop loss or the loss you're going to realise is £3,000. It's completely the wrong way around. So the whole point of risk reward is to risk a certain amount of money you know you can afford in order to gain profits and be on the right side of it. Okay? So it, it, it can be a novice mistake that traders make. That it's all very well taking the risk on and then you know getting out of the trade for a scratch or making a small profit. But really, then you might have missed the real move. You might be so glad that you've gone offside to be able to get a little bit of profit. You haven't taken the full potential of the move. And you haven't taken you know, the amount of money you set out to. So really, you're cheating yourself out of trading. Yeah. So these are the things we need to look at. And these are the things that will come clear once you trade. And come clear once you put your rules in place. So if you're looking to make a 3 to 1 ratio, if you can keep that ratio on the downside very small, then all you're playing with is profit at the end. You're not playing with a loss. And this is a much easier way of dealing with trading. It really is, trust me. So again, as I said to, to Nick, what is the correct risk ratio? Your minimum has to be one to two. Yeah. So you have to risk a thousand to make two. Make that as small as you like. Translate into, into tick terms. If you want to make 60 ticks, then your stop for your entry point should be between 20 and 30 ticks from or pips from the entry price. As simple as that. That's just common sense. Um, again, it all depends on how long you're going to hold your position for, what type of trader you are, etc., etc. But these are the things you need to put in place before you put the trade on. 
know where your out is at all points. I really can't stress that enough. So again, why beginners lose money? So many people lose money in the beginning of the trading careers because they let losing positions run deeper than they do let winning trades go on side. So again, it sounds illogical, but it happens. I've done it. I've stopped out hundreds of traders over the years. And, you know, ask them a simple question. Why did you do it? And, you know, nine times out of ten, they don't have an answer. You know, did you have a rule in place? Yeah. Why didn't you stick to it? And then, you know, a lot of the responses when I was a risk manager in the city was, well, that was your job. No, it isn't my job. My, my job is to analyze and, and help you and, you know, stop you out when you've gone past your stop and far and away from your stop. You're the intraday trader. You're the trader. You should manage your own positions in a responsible way. And that's, again, a, a thing I try to instill in people. We have to be a little bit more proactive and organized because we're just our own trader. We're our own risk department. We're our own analyst, our own economic, uh, economist. We take a lot on our plates when we trade. So, you know, we don't have the backup that all these other people have. So we've got to make sure we have our rules in place. We have things set down in stone because this will help us. You know, we're just one person against the markets. And these are the things... You know, we need to give our edge by setting things in solid stone, giving our fr ourselves a framework to work around, and making sure we're giving ourselves every, you know, every available ability to make money. So again, even professional traders, yeah, do make these mistakes and do take on more risk. Yeah, and there are many reasons for this. And again, it, the main one is not sticking to risk or strategy, not sticking to rules, believing you know more than the market, or just getting caught up in the experience, getting caught up in the noise and justifying things that just aren't there to be justified. So if you stick to your risk reward, you stick to your rules, if you can do this, you're going to become a much more powerful trader. I know this for a fact. Yeah, taught a lot of people how to trade, trade a long time and I've risked a lot of people. If you stick to your rules and you approach a winner in a, in a, in a reasonable way, and you approach a loser in a reasonable way, and you try and find that balance. You're never going to like taking a losing trade, but it's inevitability. But if we can keep them two as close as we can together and take all the emotion out of it, we're going to make a lot more money. And that's why we're trading. So again, why use stops? The stops use it. They serve a number of purposes. Okay, so protect your capital. Number one. Okay, markets are not always rational. They they can over exaggerate and they can overextend much more than we're prepared for. So your stop gets you out. You hope you know how much you're going to lose before you put the trade on. So you're already right in a certain respect. You've already protected your capital by knowing how much you can possibly lose. Yep, sometimes you can lose your capital as the market moves against you. Then you get, you know, you can get stopped out of the game. You know, you can get if you don't keep your stops in place and you know you're not concentrating or a big piece of news comes out and we're not prepared for it, you know, we could lose all our capital in a matter of minutes. You know, I've seen it happen. Then where do we go from that? You know, where do we put the new capital in? How do we raise that? You know, these are things we need to think about. We've been serious about trading. <clears throat> and again, stops. They allow you to step back, take a breather. If you're wrong, the market stop you out. That's fine. You can reevaluate. You know, you know you've lost enough money, or well, you've lost the amount of money you can afford. So you know, you can always get back into a trade at a later state. You know, it's not the end of the world. Excuses. So again, as we've mentioned before. I got stopped out when the market was going exactly where I thought it was going to go. Translates into my entry level was wrong and misjudged where the market might go first. Or I placed a position that was too big for me to handle. These are the two of the most common excuses that people have never said to me, but it's got them out of a trade. Yeah, that's human bravado, human ego. That's the real underlying message. That's the real reason why people get out of trades. So, okay, on the art, you know of judging where the market might go before it hits your target. That's where we have to adjust our entry level, our size accordingly. These are the things that are going to make us a much, much better trader by knowing the volatility, you know, how many straight line moves we might see, understanding our candles, understanding our levels. If we know where the market could extend to, then we can use our trading style around that. Maybe we trade half our normal size so let the market whip around. So when we are right or wrong, we can double up. Yeah, on the right side or the wrong side and still take on the same initial capital underlying requirement. So conclusion, risk management is the art of balancing profit expectations versus your manageable losses. So don't expect to get the market correct all the time. It just simply won't happen. And when you do lose, try and keep it small. I guarantee if you keep 
your trade small and manageable, yeah, when you're having a bad period of trading, when it does become good, you're going to look back and go, well, actually, I'm pretty glad that I took them small losses. Otherwise, I'd still be down or I wouldn't have made any profit at all. And if you achieve, achieve 7 out of 10 winning trades, then, you know, you can't let the three losing trades exceed the winning trades. Or you're not going to make any money and survive. You know, that's just a simple rule to put in place. It's just a simple, basic understanding of trading. All right, guys, any, any questions we've got? Uh, on risk management or any thoughts. Again, I'm always conscious in afternoon sessions that people have jobs and, and places to go, so I don't want to hold people up with the things you'd like to do, but we've got plenty of time for questions. Anything you'd like to ask? Any 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 words of wisdom that are, are, are ringing through? Any things we have done or haven't done? Alright, guys, well, anything else? Just, just send them through. Again, I write these presentations for you, and it's, it's all through things I've done in the past, what I've taught other traders. Again, it's, they're, they're generally meant to be, you know, kind of an overview, um, to kind of give, you know, people the tools to take away into the markets and use things for my expectations. So I just thought the feedback um, screen up as always, guys, you know, when you get a second, just let me know how you found it this afternoon. Anything else you'd like to add? If um, we've got... Some interesting things coming up in the next uh, next few weeks. Um, I'll be on FX Street for a, an exclusive three-hour live session where I'll be doing the first two modules of my Trade for a Living course. Now, if you want to watch that, that's on the 16th of February. So um, just just search for me on FX Street, Steve Roughly. You'll be able to find me. So that that'll be good to watch. I'm the only presenter on that day. Um, we've got some other courses running through Intertrader. I've done an advanced candlesticks, Elliott's Wave, so new information, new things we're going to br going to bring to the table. But again, anything else you'd like to um, to talk about or, or have, have me write about, I'll put my email address down. You know, I can I can do any of these these sessions you like. Please send any information through. So Nick saying you mentioned a strategy about having of halving state with volatile markets or the possibility of doubling up after. Could you say a bit about adjusting for volatility? Okay, Nick. Well, we know the markets are volatile at the minute. So back in the day, two three years back, um, the markets could move. 2% a day and it was seen as a huge move. These days markets can move 2, 3, 4, 5% in a day. So that, what that means is that l more extremes will be seen in the markets but less prices may be traded. So if you're looking at the market to try and make 5 ticks out of a move, realistically that move could go 5, 10, 15, 20 ticks due to less prices being traded and the more volatility. So what we can do is widen our stops so we trade less size than we normally do, i.e. half it. If the market at our original stop is 10 ticks, so we're looking to make 30 ticks at a 10 tick stop, if the market comes against us and we think, well, okay, that's not brilliant. I don't really want to be stopped at this trade yet because I think the market could go to here about another five or six ticks and then go. What we do is we take our stop out, let the market go where we thought, then we double up, which is called negatively averaging. So we take the same size of overall position, but average it out by taking two different prices and then allow for the market to go back to where we thought. Yeah? So we're buying in to a better price. But that, again, is only if we think the trade is still valid or we have some technical reasons or some fundamental news to back up why the market is not going in the direction we thought. If we think we're just being squeezed out or the market's overextending, then we buy or sell into a negative move to make sure we get a better price. So when the market does come back, yeah, we're going to make profit quicker. So I hope that answers your question. So hi, Steve. Um, why is it that the fund managers struggle to make 23% a year when many Forex instructors simply imply much more is possible? Hmm. Is it easy with retail lot sizes? Interesting question. Um, I know a lot of fund managers and you know, fund managers that I speak to are looking to make 2 or 3% a month. Yeah, so around about 23% a year. And that seems to be very, very good. When you're talking about huge sizes and funds, then that's what you can take out of the markets. A lot of forex instructors imply much more as possible because the salesmen, they're trying to get you to trade more and they're trying to get you into a dream. When you look at my sites or you look at my educational webinars, I never tell you I'm going to make you money. I'm never telling you I'm going to guarantee anything. 
there are no secrets in trading. There is no magic formula. All I tell you is, from my experience and what I've done in the past, if you're proactive, you plan, give yourself an edge, you can make money in the markets. Okay, but it's all about being realistic. You know, if there's a, a great signal provider that provided 110% correct signals every month, every time, why isn't the entire world not signed up to it? it just doesn't happen. Yeah. So, is it easy in retail? It, it can be slightly easier to get size off because you're trading over a number of prices. But they're two different worlds, to be honest. You can't really equate the two. When you're talking about funds and paper trading, it's very, very different to the average guy on the street taking an opinion and trading on a spread betting platform. They're, they're two different worlds, in, in honest. So, I wouldn't say it was easier. They were just different styles of trading. And, you know, again, the traders that I've teach that have gone on to be fund managers imply the same rules. You know, the rules are still the same for everybody. All right, guys, any other questions? Some great questions, sir. Okay, all right, what worries you if you want to make a living from trading? You know, do you need a massive account? Well, we've had people on before that have made hundreds of thousands of pounds um, over a two-year period by starting with a thousand pounds in the account. It's all about how much you want to make. It's all about how much is going to sustain you as training for a living. Remember, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Any kind of job where you start with a small amount of capital or you start a business with a small amount of capital, you don't become a millionaire overnight. You have to factor this in to how long you want to trade for, how long realistically before you become profitable. And again, it's better managing you know, by your risk water ratios, what you can make in a day to what you can make in a month. So if you've got ten thousand pounds in your account and you want to make, you know, ten percent, can you live with a thousand pounds a month? That's what you have to think about. All right, Chris is asking, is there a maximum about of leverage that we'd recommend for starting? Well leverage is leverage is just like anything, Nick uh, Chris. It's a good and a bad thing. You know, remember, leveraging is, is good when you're trading well because you're getting more bang for your buck. You're getting more money um, realistically in the markets, what you've deposited. But it, you know, the flip side of it is you're, um, you know, you're taking on that leverage risk as well. So it all depends what you're comfortable with. You know, we all trade off some sort of leverage when we're in the markets. That's just the way they work. But I would say really between three and five between three and five for, for your leverage, three times or five times your leverage is where you want to aim at. Don't really want to be above five. You don't really want to be below three. So between three and five is probably the best way to start. You're not taking on too much leverage, but you're still allowing yourself to, to make good money out of being right in trading without taking too much underlying risk for your capital. All right, guys, any, anything else we'd like to ask? Anything else? Okay, just doing one more person start to type, so I'll, I'll just hold on to that question. Okay, guys, well, like I said, we've got a lot of interesting stuff coming up uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, we're doing some more live figure trading as well, so uh, lots to look forward to. So please keep an eye on the uh, Omnovia schedule for the up-and-coming event. Again, always a pleasure. I appreciate your questions this afternoon. There's been some very good questions. I'm, I'm glad that we have this interaction because it, you know, it doesn't just help me to uh, write new material. It also helps other people in the group. And that's, uh, I think that's a really positive thing. We can all learn from each other. And um, Okay, um, th we're going to have the candlestick trading. Um, it's just been finalized and approved in a minute, but it's an advanced candlestick charting um, in, well, uh, presentation. So um, some, quite, some quite interesting stuff, continuation, reversal patterns, wedges, etc., etc. So I'll be rolling that out in the next few weeks. So again, just, just keep an eye on the emails that come out with my schedule and any new stuff will be highlighted. Um, how much time do we need in order to gain a decent experience of trading? It, it, it ranges. I'd say, yeah, a minimum six months. I would say a minimum of six months. And then you never stop learning, to be honest. You never stop learning. The second you, 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 you don't learn anymore, then you're finished in trading. 
All right, guys. Well, I think that's probably enough questions for this afternoon. I think uh, hopefully everyone's asked everything they need to. Really appreciate your attendance as always, and I hope to see you for the next seminars, which will be on, on Thursday, Thursday evening. And uh, it's been great. All right, guys, have a great afternoon, and I'll speak to you all very soon. Okay, goodbye.